So you all see a white hoe, right? But it's uh, at central, it's in Central America, it's just directly below Mexico. So if you really wanted to walk there, you could. So you won't feel like you're trapped on an island or in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's uh, primarily, it's a Spanish-speaking country. People that we, the people groups that we work with are Mayans. A lot of them, Spanish is their second language. So we have a common ground. I don't speak Spanish so well, and they might not speak Spanish so well. So it's very helpful for me to feel confident because we're all on the same plane. But there's 20 some different Mayan dialects that are prevalent in uh, Guatemala, and we work among the Mayan groups in two or three of those basic uh, language groups. Um, again, we would make uh, make uh, we would make inroads into a community by social work or whatever, and this is where you guys come in. We would partner with a church, say a pastor in a local in a local town has a passion to reach his, his city, his town, but he just can't get the traction, get the momentum to get people to come. I'm sure most pastors would tell you it's the same problem as that. Get the outreach to try to get people to end the doors so that you can give them the love of Christ. That's where you guys come in. Because first of all, uh, you don't look by it. So you're going to make an obvious impact on people. So when you would come into a village with us, we would do uh, a multitude of different things that would make a, an impact in that community in a, in a sense that we would have a dental clinic, we would have a medical clinic, we might do uh, some construction. We'll do something in that community to make an impact, a visual impact. We would come in with your team and we would uh, work alongside that local pastor. He would use that opportunity as an outreach to his community. Come get your, your eyes checked, get your teeth fixed. We're going to be building this house for this widow. You know, come Watch. While we're there, we would hold Bible studies, we would hold outreach. Uh, some people who would be gifted with children ministry would play with the kids in the street, might kind of organize a, a DBS kind of event in the streets. The kids would just swarm you. Millions of kids. It's just quite fun to watch. Uh, the ladies might do some stuff with the other ladies. These, these women uh, generally don't have a change of clothes, they don't really have an opportunity to take a shower, bathe, sit, or be pampered, I should say. So, you ladies might be able to work with the ladies in the midst of a Bible study, we'd be pampering with the ladies. Uh, the men, we would come alongside, we would have Bible studies with the children, we would maybe do some construction work. Again, the medical teams, dental teams, that would all be rolled into one package. So it's a little bit of something for everybody to be involved. So we would go into that village, we typically would stay uh, not necessarily in that village, but nearby in uh, you know, decent housing or combinations of hotel or whatever. If we're actually working near where our ministry center is, you would be staying in our house and in the Kendall's house or in a local hotel. Uh, we have uh, vans available to take us on the trips to go wherever we got to do. So you'll see down around four. So some of the things that we might do would be a construction project, which would be simply a widow's house, or fixing up somebody's house, women's Bible studies. I, uh, again, I think I've covered all these. ESL and Awana, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. English is a second language. Sometimes we get an opportunity to come into a public school and actually teach English and the gospel, which is wonderful. We can't really do that in the States. So you can actually take the word of Christ into the public schools. We have a ministry center in Guatemala City where we're doing that. Again, the medical, dental and medical things. As, as your team forms and as you become together, you may feel God calling you to your special gifting of your group to do something specific. You may say, well, these are nice, but you know what? God's really calling us this. And we'll work with you on that front and we'll try to figure out how that best suits where we are at that moment, what we're, what we're doing, and I'm sure we can you know, make all that fit. Again, it's blessed and flexible because we make our plans, but God orders our steps. And just be, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's prompting on that. So what we need you guys to be, in fact, here on page five, would be just willing. I mean, the big word here is willing. Uh, uh, to be available, to be willing, to do whatever God calls you to do. We would need people who are obviously uh, skilled in different aspects. That gives you a, a head start on some of these projects. Um, kids ministries. Anybody here speaks Spanish? No, no, I'm last one. No, I'm last one. Poquito. We're learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you're calling to go on this, there's an app on your phone that is called Duolingo. Play with it. Awesome. <laughs> We're having a great time with that. We're learning conversational Spanish, learning necessary words like baño, 
<laughs> but uh, so Spanish speakers, if there are no Spanish speakers in your team, it's not it's not the end of the world. We have plenty of interpreters that would come with us. So there's not a necess 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 necessity of you speaking Spanish. I can't even speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting ready to say this is seat dog. Are you there? <laughs> um, there's not a necessity for you to speak Spanish. We will have interpreters that will come alongside you just need to have an open heart and a loving uh, impact for your people. Um, if you're, if you're feeling prompted to go, just just pray about it. That's all I can say. And seek God's word. Read, talk to other people, and just kind of try to be sensitive to the prompting of the Spirit because it really is the most important thing. Down here on the bottom of five, you're going to see a typical day. What we're going to do is get up in the morning and have personal devotionals. Uh, that's just your quiet time with God. Just a great way to start your day. Start it today. Don't delay. Just personal devotions. And then we would get together and have a team breakfast, which would be, it's usually just a grab and growl, and prepping for sandwiches and stuff to take your lunch. A lot of times we'll be in a place where we don't have access to food, so we'll pack our own lunches or whatever and take what this brown and bag it. Uh, we would, at that point, we would, uh, at about 8 a.m., thereabouts, and you gotta remember this is Maso Manos. It's uh, too flexible. We're trying to get out the door by eight, sometimes it's later. But we'll get out the door in bands and we'll go to the project. And depending on how far away it is, when we arrive, we would get down, we would try to have a little prayer time. When we get there, we would just stop, everybody would gather their stuff, get out of the van, get settled. We try to calm everybody down and just say, let's pray real quick for the house, for the people, for everybody we reach. And we'd get to work. So we would work until lunch now. They say lunch at 12. I like to get at 1.30 or 2 because people want to see us to have lunch. I'm just that way. <laughs> once, once, I stop, once you stop at lunch, you're toast, right? So, and now we'll, we, we're very flexible with that. So we'll have, a, you know, instead of a half hour, we generally give them a little more time for lunch. And then we'll be back into the ministry or whatever we would do after that. Load back in the vans, go back to the house, clean up, dinner, uh, a decompress time. We have a, in the evenings, we like to sit around and just kind of fellowship among the team and say, what did you do today? How were you impacted? Or what did God teach you there? How did you sense you were being used in all this? So we try to, uh, we try to, not make that too structured. You know, we kind of hope that your team would lead that and would be involved and it would just be a time of sharing. And if, if you're not self-motivated, we'll pop it along. Um, on page six, now we're just getting into some nuts and bolts technicalities. Um, international travel is in here with, with issues like any travel. Um, there are some things that you would want to be aware of. You uh, want some vaccinations for uh, routine stuff. Hepe and tight and tight tetanus are the two that I would say would be the most important. Now, if you're not traveling internationally, I would recommend that you just go on the CDC site or go uh, just Google uh, international travel. Just remember that it's the bubble wrap people. You know, you're gonna you have to be perfectly preserved from anything in the world. It's not quite that dangerous. So don't don't get alarmed by oh, you should have all these things. You know, don't, now, really, your biggest risk there is Hepe. Tetanus is just because you're going to be working in a dirty environment. You get a little cut, you don't want to get infected. It's just smart to have a tetanus shot regardless. Hep A is just another good thing just to have. Typhoid, rabies, uh, uh, malaria. Everybody goes, oh my gosh, we're going to get a mosquito pit filled up with malaria. We're not in the coast of Guatemala, so just take that out of your mind. We're at 5,000 feet and above. One of our ministry centers is about 10,000 feet. Mosquitoes can't breathe up there, so we don't see them. Not a problem. So don't worry about that. I mean, about the uh, malaria stuff. It's just not really a real problem. We won't be in any areas that I'm aware of that will be at risk. If for some reason we were to do a, do a work that would be in the lowlands, we would let you know and you can get your, your malaria inoculation. On this, on this next page, on seven, now I just got to face this off the internet. This is not gospel. Yeah, you can just do your research, but your family doctor is probably not suited and may not have the vaccines to provide you for international travel. So your best bet would be to ask them what medical center, what doctor, public health clinic, where can I go to get like this hep and stuff? It's just a little bit outside of their normal stuff, so I would just have that conversation with your personal doctor. He can also advise you if you have a medical history of this or that, and you say, well, you know, you may be at risk or you might want to do this or that. Not a doctor, I don't play one on TV. Don't ask me. I'll be your doctor. 
but go online and do your research for a little bit fast um, for international travel. Another site, if you're interested, is you can go on the CIA's the State Department site and find out more about fly ball. Uh, people say, is it safe? Well, is it safe down for international green and mortar in some areas? No. I mean, the common sense dictates that you don't you separate yourself, you go out by yourself in a dangerous area, you can go out with team members, you can go out in a group. We work in safe areas. I mean, it's just we do the absolute best we can do to keep our team safe. We, we stay in gated places where, where, it's, where we stay, we are safe in a gated community. We'll be in a locked environment where it's, it's hard to be protected. We travel in groups and vans that are not you know, blasted with graphics all over and stuff like that. We just, you know, the biggest thing about missions overseas is to just keep a lower profile. Keep your, your, your best boy at home, be showy. Don't dress up, you're not there to impress anybody. Just keep a nice, low profile. And really, we've been very blessed so far. So, what does it cost? Hey, Jane, probably you're going to have to raise some support. Most people just don't have this kind of stuff laying around in their pocket. Oh, I'll just toss some money down to go. Pray about it. The team, I, I pulled some numbers off the internet. The international travel from National Airport, I don't know where they would hop out of either Miami, Dallas, or another. you're going to take a hop from here to somewhere and then get on an international flight. The average was about 700 bucks. Depending on the size of your team, you'll be able to probably get with a travel agent and get those prices down. But to travel individually, that's just a good average. Our team costs are, are basically for food, it's about $100 a day. And that covers food, transportation, housing, uh, anything that you would do in country other than your tourist shopping, personal items you would want. You're pretty much covered from door to door, airport to departure. That covers everything for you. These other little taxes and stuff, they are, we can't do anything about it. But you know, you're gonna to wanna to take some pocket cash. I will tell you that the safest way to do that is take a little bit of money with you, some dollars, maybe a hundred dollars in your pocket for the airport. When you're in country, we generally, the first day or two, we would take you to an ATM machine. And you would put in your ATM card and you would get out local currency, which is consoles. And it's eight to one. It's the best exchange rate you can get is out of the ATM machine, which is bizarre. You know, so you just go in there, we'll, we'll go as a herd to the bank, you know, we'll hit the ATM and everybody gets their cash. And you can go do, we'll do, we'll, we do factor in a day of shopping and, and uh, you know, sightseeing and stuff. So we're not gonna work you to death and send you home tired. Well, you'll be tired, but we're gonna send you home with a little smile. Um, acquiring a passport. If you don't have a passport, this section is for you. It's not a daunting task. I think you can do it at most air, at most post offices. Take your birth certificate, go in there with your, uh, you can uh, actually, with in a digital age, you can now just take your own photos on your phone or a digital camera, print it out in a format, which is two by two, two copies, staple with your thing, and you're done. Instead of giving the money to the postmaster, they mail it in, it comes back. So it's not that difficult, but uh, read through that section. That, um, has anybody here traveled internationally that has a passport? Okay, so as long as your passport's active, you're good. You have to be six months left on your passport. In other words, you can't travel with just a month left on your passport. They don't want you to get stuck in the country and you can't get out. So if your passport's about to expire, only have six months on it or less from the date that you depart, you're going to want to get it updated to get a new passport. Okay? So that's it. Uh, trust a traveler. If you guys have that TSA thing, that helps you get the Customs, but if travel is a group, you're generally going to go have to stay in the line. <clears throat> uh, back here on the back, this is a sample letter. There's two of them here, and really, it's just a map. It's just a, an idea to give you how to prepare. Uh, now, a lot of you, like I said, you may not have the money to do this. You're called, you're committed, you want to go. I don't have the money, and I know it's so hard to go around and say you know to all your relatives and say, hey, I need some money. I'm going to go to Guatemala and have a great vacation. But I'm really working for Jesus. <laughs> what you have is an opportunity through these letters to reach to the, to the unsaved friends, your co-workers, family, everybody. Because this is the beginning of your testimony. This is the beginning of your mission. Because it's, it's a sharing of what you're doing with other people. It's an opportunity to say, I'm called by God to go do this work for my Lord and Savior. You could be a partner with me and come in alongside me and, and pray for me. Please support me. And financially able, please help if you can. And it's just a great outreach tool. When we, uh, 
when you come back, I strongly suggest that, that your team get together and do a decompressor and kind of just a kind of a download of how did it go, what the highlights, what the downsides was on. But then as an individual follow-up to your donors, you send them a thank you. You can send them a letter and say, I really appreciate your confidence to send me to Guatemala to do this. And this is what I did, and this is how God used me, and this is how I was blessed. Because it says you're going to go down here thinking that you're going to get blessed. You know, you're going to bless other people, but you, truthfully, you're going to come away being much more blessed than you give. You know, you can't outgive God. You just can't do it. You give one, He gives you three. You give three, He gives you ten. What do you have to outgive? You can't do it. So if you're if you're willing and sensitive to the prompting of God to do what He's asked you to do, He's going to bless you. He's going to put you. He's going to double down on what He's already given. So just be prepared to come back and go. Oh my gosh, I'm so lit up to Jesus. Let's go to Seven Eleven and fill that with that. You know, it's just the way it works. Um, and that's the hope. I mean, um, my hope, my prayer and my hope is that some of you, after this trip, say, you know, the Lord's really prompted me to dig deeper about missions. You know, yeah, I got a nice life in, in Tennessee, and I like it here. But, you know, maybe God just wants to get you a little uncomfortable pushing me out there. We didn't have that notion. You know, we're, you know, when I tell people I'm a missionary, it's like, ah, I just feel weird saying that because I'm just a guy. You know, I'm just a carpenter person. But we diligently sought God. And he said, this is what I want for you. And we just tried to listen and be faithful to what he asked us to do. The doors closed, the doors open, and it's been just everything went that way. So pray about that. Really, really seek him because he just may have something bigger than one shot one trip. Um, I'm going to take some questions, a little Q&A. So anything you got, toss down me. I'll do my best. What kind of medical uh, things do they have down there? The socialized medicine? They have, um, basically, if you come down as an American with a visa card and you have a medical event, you would actually, about, what are the, what are the the local experience in they have, it depends on their social status or their financial status. Basically, those that can afford it would go to a better doctor. For the most part, yeah, it's not really socialized medicine, but it's subsidized medicine. Okay. So you would be, So it uh, is a need then? Oh, definitely. Definitely, And yes. then for people who are medical that want to go down there and practice, do they have to go through? government officials or they can just come down there and use their own licenses. If, like Doctors Without Borders, those type of thing. If you were a large organization coming in with a big footprint, you would probably want to let somebody know what we're doing. We have one of our one of our missionaries is actually a dentist. He's a Guatemalan Dennis the dentist. I love him. <laughs> Dennis the dentist <laughs> does missions. He does medical dental missions. We did one last fall and treated 600, 600 patients in five days. Just Mass chaos. They had a bunch of dentists that came out of the teaching school in town in Guatemala City and they just list. We didn't give permission, we just went into the village and did it. On a smaller scale, with a medical doctor, we had a couple of doctors or some nurses or some medical people. Um, we would figure out how to make that the best use of that. Um, we've done eye glass clinics where we just did reading glasses. Those are very helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. And so, as far as like bringing medications down there and stuff, is that is a little bit of a problem. Yeah, okay. bringing meds for whatever reason, Guatemalan government about three or four years ago kind of put their hands up with the meds. We used to be able to ship down a lot of just over-the-counter stuff. Um, I think it's more of a taxing issue than a control issue. They just don't like a lot of free flow coming into the country and un you know excise tax. So, um, if you were to come down with a medical team and you're going to bring a boatload of meds, what we would do typically what we'd ask you to do is pack team bags. We suggest that you try to live out with a carry-on. First of all, you're not bringing bling, you're not bringing your food food. You know, it's dirty work clothes, you're just gonna live in it, you're gonna be fine. And we ask you, uh, depending on what you're gonna be doing, possibly you could carry up to 100 pounds, two 50 pound duffel bags. And that would be supplies that you could bring, A for service for him, B for the ministry we're doing, C for whatever gifting you guys have. So the challenge we have is when you're bringing you know, 400 pounds of meds, that sets up a big red flag. So we would kind of disperse and ask you not to just bring yourself a stuff of meds. You just kind of have to disperse it through your carry-ons. And you know, you just don't want to draw attention to yourself. So we can get to that point on a workaround, but you just can't bring in trunk loads of meds. It just doesn't, it, it does set up red flags. Anything else? What else we got? It's good food. You probably, you know, and, and you know, we feed you well, we, we prepare everything, and you, you, everybody's heard, don't drink the water. Don't drink the water. <laughs> don't drink the water. 
we provide clean drinking water, and obviously since our ministry started as a clean water ministry, we're pretty uh, aware of this. So we do make sure that everybody has filtered water, bottled water, safe water to drink in the environment and in the field. So you'll probably fill up a water jug to take with you. We take uh, what we call garfonsers, but it's five gallon bottles we'll take this with us. But inevitably, somebody's going to you know, slip up somewhere. You can't peel it, you should eat it. You know, or you don't, eat, don't buy stuff with the food vendors on the street. You know. Just using common sense, but we can get to that later. But it's it's not as bad as you think. You know, you're probably going to get a little diarrhea. It's a good chance just because of the change in the environment. But uh, yeah, yeah. pops the modium and Joel or Jay Craig a bottle of wine. So we're prepared for that. We have we have to answer your questions from a personal medical standpoint. Americans with a visa card, if you have a medical emergency, you would get the very best health care just by having a visa card to get you. Do they have like electricity 24-7 or is it one of those things that's still bad? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> where you are, it depends on where you are. Where you'll be staying uh, typically is a safe environment with running water and power and all that stuff. In the villages where we're working, maybe not so. Um, you, know, you deal with it. The water flow there is kind of sporadic. A lot of <clears> municipalities <throat> have a public water supply, but it's not, you can't drink it. But it flows erratically to the house, a pipe would break, you know, work for three days or whatever. So everybody has this thing called a kila, which is a three bowl sink. And they just leave the faucets open all day long and it fills up and you know it's full and turned off. But so everybody kind of works at it and that's the health issue. The power is kind of the same way. You know, it's just nobody really has refrigerators. So when the power goes out, they go to bed, it's dark. <laughs> the one light bulb in their house goes off and they go to bed. Um, they're not really because expensive and most people are not really reliant on electricity for stuff. So again, they may have one single bulb. Most people cook over a wood fire. Uh, part of what we do is also with the healthy sanitation stuff. People, a lot of the Mayan women, culturally, they cook on the ground over an open fire. Your eyes are ruined, you know, from the smoke and stuff. Well, when they got housing, you know, whatever century that was, they still still cooking their houses. So they're in an environment, a closed environment, cooking over this thing. So their eyes are really bad. So even one light bulb, is, you know, they can't really see. Um, part of what we do is we try to provide people with wood stoves, cook stoves in their house. You know, it's, it's just basically a center block box, what we call a poncho, which is a steel top that people glue burns. And imagine this a stove pipe that goes out the roof. You know, and they're so thankful they get the smoke out of their house. But these are the kind of challenges that they live with. The power of electricity to them is really kind of a luxury. I mean, I've been in so many houses where they sleep on a dirt floor on a, on a woven mat, and electricity isn't even part of the equation. But we've done, we put houses together for people who live uh, four sticks in the ground with a little piece of tin over top of them, and the only thing they have for privacy is corn canes that they've woven into a mat just to have a little privacy. You know, water and when it rains goes right to their house, they sleep on a mud. So uh, electricity is a costly uh, thing that they may not be able to afford. But we're, if we're working somewhere where it's required, we would have a generator. But generally, we're pretty okay with what we're doing. All we do have some cordless tools that we might charge up and bring along with us. Uh, if we're going to a medical clinic or dental, we've had to run dental equipment off the generator. You know, depending on where you are. So again, that's part of the flexibility. We, we try to we find a need and then we try to adjust to the need in whatever way we can. Don't drink the water. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, if we're working in a village or if we're working at somebody's house, the banyo may be nothing more than a hole in the backyard with that aforementioned piece of tin and some wood husk around it for privacy or some trash bags flapping in the breeze. And, uh, you know. Bring toilet paper. Bring toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. Recommended. Bring toilet paper. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there's there's times when there's emergencies and you just uh, you adjust. Uh, typically, we try to be sensitive to American teams, and we would not put you in a situation where we that rat. Uh, it just wouldn't do so. We try to be sensitive to that. We try to accommodate the team so that they're not so. Because uh, I mean, most people wouldn't uh, need an out of house or you know, out back in the arms. We try to be sensitive. Exactly. We don't want it. Well, good, so we're, we're going to take you up that way. But 
for the most part, I mean, you're going to be seeing stuff that, you know, is not even the one with the point Like I said, food, we can prepare food, we can prepare bottled water for you, give a safe place to sleep, transportation, take you up to the airport, take you back to the airport, or you can try to factor in a day of tourism where you can go shopping at a local economy. I will tell you, and, and this is one thing you, you might want to Google, is where we are located is in Antigua, which is actually an international tourist destination. I'm just saying, it's beautiful. <laughs> so do look into that. But I mean, we may not be working there, but that's where we generally operate out of. Uh, it's a, it was uh, uh, founded in the 1400s. There's some beautiful ruins there, 1500 Spanish uh, architecture. Uh, it's situated kind of in the middle of three volcanoes, Fuego, Agua, and Cayo. Every now and then, you'll just be minding your own business. <laughs> what was that? You know, oh, just a five over. <laughs> we're in safe, we're in safe housing. It's not a problem. But it is a, it is a seismically active area. It makes it exciting. You guys feel like you need to put a team together and you're really called to come down and work uh, in this field doing what we do. Uh, we would work with your church with Pastor Brian about setting up a date that would work for your church. Uh, typically that's in the summertime because most people have kids and vacation time and all that kind of stuff. So we see the most amount of teams pretty much the June through September. Uh, believe me, we are not carved into that format. We have a team in February is actually better because it's drier. Uh, we have, I tell people we have two seasons. We have wet spring and dry spring. Right now it's wet spring. Uh, it rains pretty much from April to October. Uh, and when I say rain, it's just like an afternoon shower. <laughs> and it goes. Uh, and then the rest of the time it's the dry spring. It's not raining. They have two growing seasons. Uh, it's just pretty much temperate. It's always in the 60s, 70s, 40s, 50s. 40s is really cold today. 50s is more appropriate. Um, so, I say that to say that whatever works for your church, whatever works for this group, whatever you guys agree that it works, that's what we'll accommodate. As long as, you know, we're going to work together as long as everybody is on furlough back and down there and you show up, that means they're going to reach the airport. We work that out. So, anytime. Anytime and whenever you choose, whatever <coughs> you choose, you choose your dates. We want to do start spending the And uh, to add to that, that kind of, that will determine really who's going will kind of determine Start kind of funneling down to okay, who's actually going to be making the trip, and then we'll work out the trip. <clears throat> and depending on our schedule, we may be able to come down and kind of help you in one of those team meetings. I'd strongly recommend. We, we really tell the churches it's 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 great to have like three, four, five team meetings prior to you coming down because you want to build team unity, you want to get closer, and you know the, the time to feel better about your teammates is not when you arrive in Guatemala. You should already know. So you know you want to do some fellowshipping together and some praying together, or some planning, preparation, you know, we have to like, we always suggest you have a team pack thing because if you are bringing supplies down, just bring it all in here, throw it on the floor, try to figure out how to stuff it into some bulky bags and get it down to us. Um, so, and we're available to help you kind of help that format put that together, what works for you guys, but you would want to do some team building and some, obviously some preparing, some planning, um, and we can help guide you along with, with Pastor Brian on how to do all that. So it's supplies be mailed to you in advance? Very difficult. It's you know DHL doesn't know why mom exists. It's so hard to get stuff down there. Uh, that's why we we kind of take advantage of teams coming. We use them as mules because we need supplies. We say, could you guys bring 700 electric boxes or you know five miles of wire, or whatever it is that there's a need for? Because a it's just you know, cheaper here than it would be there, or it's not available. So to ship stuff down, I'll give you an example. There used to be a company called Madrona. We could ship a 20 by 20 by 20 cardboard box, which is not very big. Whatever, it didn't matter about the weight, but it's the size of that box. Whatever you could jam that box, it would take, it was like 220 bucks, 240 bucks. It's not cheap. 
uh, to get stuff there. So we generally, you know, if there's something there's a need that your team needs, like we're going to do DPS, we're going to bring a bunch of stuff to the kids. We're going to stuff it in a duffel bag and bring it down. And it's nice if you can bring them extra so we'll have some for the next team that might not have it. So we kind of, we warehouse some of that. You know, we have stuff there and we're always looking for replenishment and supplies. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that we would communicate with you as your team is gelling and as you got an idea of what you're doing, we'd say, you know what, if you guys could bring this or you could bring that or if you're gonna be doing this, if this is what your team is challenged to do, then bring these supplies with you. But yeah, but to ship down in advance is, unless there's somebody here that's a logistics person and knows how to do that, we're not. Uh, I mean, I've looked into it. Um, I've done some international shipping. It's not ever turned out very well for me. So I tend to, it's not my forte. Um, I know there's companies that do that. I just do not utilize it because it's, it's kind of problematic. Bad side, the bad part of that for us is the little box that comes is easy because it shows up at your doorstep. There's no hassle to do anything in any quantity like a container and less than ship load. You need a custom broker on the other end. And uh, that gets problematic because it's what they call a pocket tax. And it's like whatever the broker guy thinks it's worth, that's the pocket tax you hear. You know, there's a lot of that going on. People don't, you know. Yeah. So, you know, it's just part of the So you can't get small boxes down there? We can, well, we can get, uh, Madrona was a company we used to use because it was local. They've been out, they went out of business and we're looking, there's another company that does that. They don't take anything from 20 by 20 to a 30 by 30. Up to, that's as big a box as they'll take, but they, again, it's, it's cost to do it. It's, I mean, it's 400 bucks a day, 450 for that 30 square box. Can we pay for extra bags? Yes, you could. Please do. Thank you. <laughs> you can bring anything you want. I mean, typically on an international flight, you'll have to carry. 50 pound checks and one uh, carry on. Uh, you know, obviously, airlines are all different now. It depends on what <laughs> airline company you go with. Those are some variables I can't, I can't identify, but typically, you'd be able to take two 50 pound check bags. And then, if you work out of carry on, then you're able to take 100 pounds of stuff per person to help you administrate what you're doing. And did the women, did they frown upon women in pants? No. Now, I will say, you know, we can get to that. It's like, you know, please don't wear your two tops, your, 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 your booty shorts, any of that kind of stuff. The, the Mayans are very, very modest people. They wear, the Mayan women call a dress, it's called a corte. It's seven yards of fabric, and they wrap around. I mean, that's, they're bound up like in a tent. I mean, but that's the way they dress, and they wear a repeal, which is a blouse that comes with a thing that's on their arms, and it's very, you know, loose fitting. That's what they live in. They're very, they're very modest. So we ask our team to please, please, please dress appropriately. Women can wear can wear pants. They can wear capris, but we ask you not to wear shorts, spaghetti strap stuff, anything that's that's showing stuff that you wouldn't want show. Just kind of be sensitive to that. You know? So again, we, we try to keep a very small footprint. We don't want to go there and stand out and make a big show of ourselves. We're not there about us. We're there about them. So we want to serve them in whatever way makes sense. Really, truthfully, a lot of the women uh, will have dual wardrobes. I mean, for the most part, they're going to live in their corte and stuff, but they will have a Western garb. They'll occasionally wear. Uh, so, when you take clothes down, we just need to we'll coordinate that as well. You know, some things are broken, some aren't. But don't take anything over size six men's shoe. I mean, most mines are this tall. Yeah. You know, it's just they're not going to be able to wear it. So, those kind of things. Um, and nothing that's you know, gross graphics or anything crazy like that. Just sensible. Uh, but the ladies and women can wear pants, you can wear capris, uh, blouses, you know, like again, just covered up guys, shorts. You kind of frown on them because it's just not safe. You know, it's just you're going to cut the leg or something. It's just good to wear long pants um, and, you know, some decent work shoes, socks and shoes. I generally wear cotton button up shirts because they breathe better than a t shirt. They just feel better for me. But uh, church, you know, so it's quite appropriate to go to church in your clean or work clothes. You know, um, Bring your suit tie, it'll be fine. Because we go to Calvary Church, we don't wear shirts hanging out anyway. Hawaii shirts. Um, clothes, again, dressing for spring. Generally, we have a washing machine available, so you don't have to like bring clothes, change clothes for every day. You'll get an opportunity to wash the 
showers. Cool stuff like that. But uh, what is the age range? Good question. Age range, um, 16 and up is preferable. 16 to 18, we really, really want family member with our adult. Uh, because where we're going, what we do, we're not really set up to take youth teams per se. Having said that, if you have mature youth in your group, you have uh, adults that are willing to uh, pretty much shepherd them and stay with them, that's fine. So I mean, we've had 14 to 15 year olds, it's not a problem. You know, as long as they're with their parents and, and they understand the rules that, you know, it's a, it's a benevolent dictatorship, they should do it. Because <laughs> I mean, it's, there's so much opportunity for failure for a young person. No, I'm not saying uh, 14 is probably the, the youngest we would take. Uh, you know, 15, 16 is fine, 18 is getting better. Well, because they're, they're uh, generally a little more aware. They let me go on 13. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think when the Kindles were here, uh, she was mentioning, did they mean like school supplies and crayons and markers? I didn't think the school supplies are on sale right now. Oh, yeah. um, I would say as a rule, yes. Um, there, but we need to go out for them because there's certain things that they do. Uh, they really like the, uh, they don't use any of the spirals or loose leaf paper, but they all have to use the black kind of, not seeing the cat, it's what they call the, the composition. composition book. So almost all the schools, I mean, pretty much all of them, all the schools and otherwise, they all have to have composition books. Markers are not necessarily necessary, more of a pencils, uh, rulers, uh, cheap calculators, stuff like that. But if, if that's your passion, let me know and we'll get you list of what it's really good. I remember saying something like that um, here, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, absolutely, because I mean, that's such a great gift to give these kids, because they don't have money for those things. Uh, they all have to pay for school, even though it's public, they all have to pay to go to school. So, um, we used the scholarship and a guy out of control, I mean, it's just a need we can fill. So, but we do help with supplies and stuff, and every now and then we'll do a clothes drive and book bags and those kind of things. I can't remember when the school starts there. But again, as your team forms and as you feel God's calling you to do stuff, you'll have a better idea of what you want to bring and what we can work with you to coordinate that. Toxic chair, yeah. Toxic chair. Um, you know, uh, we all have a heart. We would go see kids in a street that don't have anything. And your heart is just to take you out of your pockets and just gain all your cash. Don't ever do that. You will get swamped. First of all, you don't have a deep enough well to provide for every other kid on that street. And you just set that kid up. I've seen people, or not seen it, but I've heard of people who bring bags of candy. They just want to give them a candy. They've got a passion to give back candy to a kid. You, you, you just can't. Because what happens, again, you're going to get small. You're going to get covered up. You're not going to have enough for everybody unless you, you just can't. And it, it ends up being more harmful because then the kids kind of get to associate how the green is bringing gifts. You know, they don't think about why we're really there. The gift we're bringing is, is God. You know, we really want to gift them hope of a spiritual life if they give them some hope. And the temporary of the gifts and candy and, and shoes and stuff, it just it, it just doesn't last. So we really challenge you to to think about that. We, we really discourage you. As a matter of fact, out and out, we would just ask you don't. Uh, to not hand out stuff to kids. You know, uh, as much as it breaks your heart, pray for them. Talk to them about Christ. Give them hope for their whole life, not just for that minute for a piece of candy. For a pair of shoes, say, you know, I, I, I can give you something that lasts forever. I give you living water that's not going to go away. And that's really why we're there. And that's why we hope you're there. So just uh, just be aware of that. I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's a pitfall we all go through because our heart breaks. Let's do the evangelism. Uh, we can certainly aim you in the areas where.
there's, you know, we've, we've done soccer ball ministries. We've had, you know, the, the Jesus bracelets with the colors, you know, where you go through with the, you know, green is for life, red is for Jesus, white is for your sin, black is for your sin. Uh, we work through those with uh, soccer balls. You, you get a soccer ball that's got these colors on it. You go out and you start playing soccer. You young guys do, I like can better than just pick up a street game. You will slam. Yeah, kids, they're kids, they're going to school you. I'm sorry, they're just going to school you. I, uh, I've seen guys that are really good soccer players get schooled by 10 year olds. But um, awesome. the soccer balls we have down there have the colors on it. And you pick up a little pickup game, you pick up the ball, and you go, plastic ball with that colors on it. What are you doing? See, this road, that's sin. You know, and you're going to have an interpreter there. And you go through the salvation message, and if some kid gets saved, here, here's your soccer ball. Tell your buddies. You know, and they're like lit up. And they're going to go play with their buddies and say, hey, why is your ball got colors on it? What a gringo told me. So, you said there's all these opportunities for that. Uh, the bracelets, the beads with the kids, we'll, we'll uh, uh, you're going to do that, like a, a children's outreach. We can, we can help set you up with the colored beads. The kids will sit down and take the bracelets. And the colors will say, What are the colors you Well, the red is black is death, white is light. And you go through that, and it's an it's a outreach, it's a salvation. It's a, well, absolutely. We would love you. Yes. So, there's tons of resources uh, for that. So if that's what you guys leave you guys to do as an outreach and evangelism, God bless you. And uh, we would probably still turn it in into uh, some sort of works as well. You know, we can evangelize the community outreach, evangelize the community, bring them in. Dennis, the dentist's wife, Chochi, is a gifted musician, and she does children concerts. And she dresses like, you know, bright colorful clown colors and stuff. And she does a wonderful salvation show for the kids. And the kids are just all down in front of you, just mesmerized. And she does a salvation issue. And at that point, if you guys have done the work in the neighborhood, then you can work through the crowds and bring kids to Christ. So hand out tracks, hand out Bibles, um, just pray for prayer walks. So pray, 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 pray. And then be ready to do something different. <laughs> God will bless you. You're diligent to seek him, and, and, you, and you know you're being called to do this. We will see. I just read what you were reading out of Luke uh, today. I was reading, I guess last week you talked about Jesus and the word fishing. And I just, I always love that analogy because they're fishing, and Jesus says, cast again. He says, we've been fishing. They may not squat. He says, yeah, but since you asked me, I will. And they fish again, and they got this huge harvest. So when we fish in our own strength, we don't do so well. But if you listen to God, and you listen to your Lord and Savior, He says, "Fish here, you better do it." And you're going to get blessed, and you're going to get this abundance that you're just not able to carry. So I, I, that's why I say, pray first, seek God. He tells you, fish, fish. spoken to in the past, kind of get a little schooled up for Christ, and it's good. By the way, I think our first team building will be Spelunky. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pray for uh, Mary and Kita. And, uh, by the way, some of you don't know this, uh, Mary and Kita are Kara's uh, mom and dad, and uh, that's how we got connected with their ministry, and uh, I think that was really just a little bit of there, so we're pretty excited about that. So well, I'll tell you, let me let me pray. Uh, if you need anything comes up afterwards, you want to talk to them, we feel good. And uh, uh, going forward, the next thing that I would like to do after this is, uh, and I'll by email I'll send it out, but certainly I uh, will make mention of church. But next, I'd like to find out who'd like to actually be involved 
in participating in this outreach, whether it's going or whatever part you'd like to play. But at least then I can sort of get a sense of what that team looks like. So, uh, and then from that point, we'll start setting up, like Barry suggested, just additional meetings, preparing, and even kind of getting together, making a point to pray together, do some stuff together as we prepare to make that. <coughs> Uh, and, and by the way, as we have mentioned before, you may not feel led to go, but you'd still like to participate, whether it's by prayer, maybe God's put on your heart to, to give, or whatever it might be to, to this effort. Um, you're part of the team by whatever part you're playing here. So, so, uh, so you're not in just because you're going, you're in because you're part of it. So uh, we'll start to put that together in the weeks to come. But, uh, Brian, just a thought. Uh, you know, Based on the number of people that might come out of this group as a subgroup to make the trip, uh, is it possible or practical to perhaps team up for a larger group or contingency with a couple of other Calvaries that might be going from the area? Uh, actually, a couple of them approached me about it already. So, okay. yeah, we talked about it, that, that probably will happen. I, I think the greater impact, you know, if we can get down as a group of people representing, you know, more of an organization from Nashville, Tennessee, and Franklin, and so on, I just think that that has more impact for us as well because as Barry just said when you come back you're more of a family and there's no reason that we shouldn't be family here in Nashville as well and do more things together and I know you know our, our uh, conference the prophecy conference coming in spring or in fall in October is going to be much of the same um, where we are banding together to to have a greater impact of synergy I just think that that's something that we could look at here too um, ask the Lord Lee's. I mean, the biggest we've had was, I think, 24. And, and I'm, I'm not going to put a cap on God because if he's bigger than me, he'll beat me up. But what happens is logistically, when it gets too big, it's difficult to just, it's not impossible, but it complicates some of the flow. Uh, and that's really the only challenge. It's like, you know, we can't get 70 people in one place to stay in one place. They can't all eat together at one time. So what happens is you kind of lose a little bit of the unity of the group if it gets too large, uh, but it's not impossible. So I would I would say let's uh, pray about it and see what God brings. I would I would want to paint it into a corner. Unless you're going to draw another out. No. <laughs> well, Taylor, let me close in prayer again. If anyone wants to stick around and, and uh, talk to uh, Barry Kidd, uh, they'll be here. And uh, just stay tuned in the weeks ahead. Any of you that uh, are not, uh, well, probably do, but once we start to turn, who's getting involved, let's put together an email list of those people so that you'll be regularly getting updates on what's happening and we'll schedule things together. If I don't have your email address and you'd like to give that to me, uh, please do it on me. But uh, let me pray, and uh, we'll just got to be able to send that away. Father, I want to thank you for this time to come together to discuss this opportunity to serve you in ways that uh, maybe outside of what uh, we've experienced before. Some, some of you may have done this. And, but uh, for some of us, Father, this, this is uh, exciting as a brand new kind of a thing. And, uh, Father, a lot of planning goes into this and uh, preparation and everything. But Father, we know that, uh, that even as, you know, again, as as the Lord, Barry was pointing earlier, Lord, we might make our plans, but you ultimately guide our steps. And so pray that, Father, you give us wisdom, direction, and, uh, and, and just a desire to be at your hands and feet as you would call us. And so, uh, Lord, for those that you would call to be involved in this ministry down in Antigua, I pray that, Father, you would just uh, speak to us by your Holy Spirit, give us a sense of genuine calling and purpose and stepping out this way. I pray that, Father, you would uh, just prepare us in the days ahead, give us a sense of when you'd like us to go and in all the particulars, Father. We want to leave this in your hands. No detail is too big or too small. And so we just want to give this all to you. I pray that you guide our steps. I pray, Lord, that uh, uh, you would just bless uh, Barry and Kia and Forrest and Carol, Lord, and the entire team down there at service for him. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being your partner. I just ask that God you and him just continue to work with them as they reach the communities down there. And, and no doubt, generations will be affected by the outreach to the folks down there. And Father, we rejoice in the possibility of just how many of these folks we're going to see face to face one day as we all gather around here. So we thank you, Father. Thank you for coming today. Pray that God, as we go out this place, you go before us and just guide our steps as we prepare for this in Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. Uh, we got some cards here with our mail address if you want to reach out to us or to Brian or however. If you're interested in getting on, on that website, sign up for our newsletter, get on the mail list. And